Hi, I'm Angela Fair. I share weekly lessons here on YouTube to help you become a more confident watercolor artist and love your watercolor journey. Today we're painting a beautiful Irish landscape scene using a selection of brushes from Rosemary & Company. Hang around because I'm going to tell you how you can win a set of travel brushes from Rosemary & Co. Let's get started. Rosemary & Company is a family-owned business making paintbrushes in the UK. I'm excited to be demoing these brushes today and I'm going to tell you what I think about them. Rosemary & Company sends their mail order catalog for free anywhere in the world. So if you want to take a look at the brushes, uh, this is a great way to do it. All the brushes in the catalog, the watercolors brushes are in the front, uh, are photographed at actual size so you can know exactly the size that you're going to get when you place your order. I'll put a link to order your catalog in the description below the video. So it's always fun to use new brushes. Uh, the only drawback with the new brush is that you never really know uh, until you've used it for a little while how it's going to be. Uh, I find I like to give a brush a little bit of time to really get acquainted with me and me with it. Uh, when you buy a new brush, the plastic sleeve that the brush comes with is not intended to be reused. If I try to jam that back on my brush after painting, it very likely will catch some of the beautiful fine hairs in the brush and bend them backwards. We don't want that, so throw this away. Also, you want that air circulation so that your brush dries thoroughly and you don't have any mold growing in your brush. Uh, this is the Series 170 Pure Squirrel, and I'm choosing it right now because it is the largest brush, and when I begin a painting, I want to work with a big brush. A new brush does come with a little coating of, I believe, gum arabic to help it keep its shape, and so it's going to feel a little stiff when it first goes in the water. Uh, just uh, dip it in the water, uh, work it back and forth a little bit, and you'll feel it get soft right away. We're going to paint a soft, beautiful sky. Uh, first of all, uh, catching those major shapes in the background of the landscape, and that we're going to need the big brush for that. I'm working on Arsh's 140 pound uh, cold press today, and I'm just going to wet my sky down with my damp brush. A uh, squirrel brush is very soft. I can feel those soft, natural fibers. Uh, we're not going to debate the ethics of uh, using natural hair brush. If you've chosen not to use natural hair brushes, we'll be talking about synthetic uh, a little later in the video. Once that first wash of water goes down and my paper is nice and shiny, uh, with moisture, sometimes that takes going over it twice. Um, you want it shiny but not um, dripping with moisture we're going to go in and put some soft clouds in. This is a beautiful soft sky in Ireland from the watercolor workshop I taught in Ireland earlier this year. And you can download the reference photo. There's a link below in the description. So we're just going to place in some soft color. This is lavender. Uh, if you don't have lavender, it's kind of a specialty color made by Daniel Smith. Uh, a nice uh, color to use would be to mix maybe a little bit of cobalt blue. Just a hint of quinacridone magenta. Give you that violet tone. And that gives you a beautiful soft blue-violet and varying the proportions, of course, will give you a different, a beautiful range uh, in the blue to violet range. And that can give a really nice softness as well. Remember that with a squirrel brush like this, it holds a lot of water. So the water, I'm adding water to my paper as I continue to paint that juicy color uh, going on the paper. Um, I like that. I kind of like that. Um, the other. The other thing you can do is when you have this nice soft blue violet, maybe you want a bit of a gray uh, for some foreboding storm clouds. I'm going to grab a little burnt sienna. It's a bit of an orangey, rusty brown. And adding that into my blue violet mixture will give me a gray. And in this case, it's a beautiful gray violet, which I think will look really nice uh, and subtle. And I really like adding a brown, uh, a burnt umber, a burnt sienna to a blue to create a neutral gray. And it can be a brownish gray if you just add a little more, uh, if you tilt the balance in the favor of the 
of the brown and it'll be a bluish gray if you add a little higher proportion of blue. So there's our beautiful murky sky. I don't want to go too dark because this is actually the lightest value in my painting and I want to keep it light. And now the neat thing about a landscape that has this kind of scope is we have natural barriers that give us the opportunity to continue painting even while keeping the different elements in our painting from running into each other. There's a couple things I want to plan for. First of all, there's a bush that kind of comes up in front of the sky here. If I soften this line, that'll give me a nicer transition of overlaying my bushes with my sky. So I'm going to do that right there. I'm going to keep this crisp edge to give me my distant hill. And I actually have realized that my observation skills failed me and the shape of my hill is different than the reference photo. Uh, good news is that's something we call artistic license and it doesn't really matter. Um, I'm always at arranging my hills to better suit my composition. So while the sky dries, we can actually skip this far distant hill and paint the green kind of field that we have in the, the mid-ground. And so we're going to do that now. Uh, finding the right green. And a lot of people say they have had trouble mixing greens. We're still working with that squirrel brush. And we'll get into the other brushes later. I find mixing green, just start with a green and add, uh, if you want to make it a little warmer, a little more olive toned and earthy, add a little rusty, rusty brown to it, similar to how we created our gray. Or you can add a little blue or violet to it to give it a more of a shadowed color. And that's my field right there, that's really all that's necessary. Again, we have bushes in the foreground, and I want those bushes to overlap with my field in a natural way. Again, I want to soften this edge so that when my bushes come up, they're not overlapping uh, the tra <laughs> with transparent watercolor. Any line that gets overpainted with another color is often still visible through that first wash. So giving, giving some softness to those overlapping areas when you anticipate an overlap will make it easier to create that subtlety. Okay, so that's the two elements I can get actually paint right now. Uh, and I can spend a little bit of time, I think, painting my bushes here as well. The, I love this cluster of um, the mass of the shrubbery in the foreground. That's really, to me, that's the balance between the sky and the shrubbery is, is the interesting part of the painting. So I'm, I'm going to spend some time and have some fun with my brushes when I paint that foreground. But I can set the stage for it right now with a little bit of underpainting. And that'll just give me some soft colors to work with to build on, rather than just having white paper showing through. So we're going to use some of this kind of burgundy mix that I had in my palette from a previous painting. Uh, I believe it's a perylene violet uh, mixed with some quinacridone magenta. And we're going to start with that. I think that'll do. Uh, we're, I want to let, I want to leave this open-ended enough so that I can make small adjustments when I go in to paint the rest of the painting. Right now I'm going to set it aside to dry thoroughly. This is going to be a two-stage painting. We need that pause in between so that we have some crisp lines where the hill is and then that opportunity to create all that textured foliage in the foreground. I really believe that one great brush can do the bulk of your work when you're painting. Uh, a round brush with a fine point can carry a lot of paint to the pa paint and water to the paper and fill your page quickly, fill in large areas. And when it has a fine point like this, you can also create fine detail. So 90% of my brush work can be done using one brush. That makes it really hard for me to review brushes because I use such a small range of brushes. At the same time, I love when I'm working with mark making, having a variety of brushes to play with. When Rosemary and Company contacted me about trying out some of their brushes, I asked them for some very specific shapes. Uh, I love the contours of a pointy brush uh, that gives me that fine mark making detail and that thick body that allows you to make big marks as well. And I love an interestingly shaped brush for creating unexpected marks. And I've been using uh, a brush called a dagger striper from another manufacturer for quite a few years. So I wanted to see if I could find from Rosemary and Company a similar brush. 
because I wanted to provide more options for my students. So Rosemary and Company sent me, uh, first of all, this tr uh, set of three triangular brushes. And these are uh, the Series 40. And these are a squirrel and synthetic mix. They're a blended brush. And I'm looking forward to trying them out. They have uh, the triangular part comes in the shape of the bristles. And you can see this, how it's angled. And I'm really curious as to how that's going to perform. And then we have the Series 38 Squirrel Mix Oval. And again, a slightly more unusual shape, not your standard. It's a flat brush rather than a round uh, with that point. So I'm looking forward to trying that. These are a sable blend and these would be more of a sword brush. Uh, this is a pure sable series 98 and this is a number six round and the pure sable of course are going to be your more premium brush. What I really like about this brush though is that it's got a triangular handle which they which they say is preferred by people who have trouble with their hands. So if you're struggling with holding a brush uh, because you have trouble with arthritis or something like that, a triangular handled brush might feel more comfortable and for you. And then finally a pure sable rigger. This is the series 90 in the number six. And so this is a, a smaller rigger than I usually use, but again, looking forward to comparing the pure sable with the... Before we go on and I let you know how you can win a set of three travel brushes. These are the round squirrel brushes. There's an R9, an R14, and a no name. No. I have this beautiful set of three travel brushes. That's why you can't see the bristles is because the brush actually nests inside the handle and uh, really ideal for travel because it protects the bristles and uh, is much more compact. You can enter to win these. There's a link in the description below the video for your link to enter. Just before we move on, if you are looking for a, synth a purely synthetic brush, the ones I'm demonstrating today are, are either uh, natural hair or a blend. Uh, Rosemary and Company does carry synthetic brushes as well. What I've noticed is that a synthetic brush generally has a firmer texture. Uh, more snap as, as they say when you're painting so it just feels a little bit often a little tiny bit stiffer it doesn't have the softness of the natural hair when I was learning to paint I actually preferred the synthetic brush the the snap and stiffness felt more controllable to me than a very soft natural hair brush so you will do get a different performance than you get from natural hair that is just something you, that you do sacrifice if you're purchasing synthetic brushes I still have quite a ripple in here which tells me there is still some lurking moisture in my sky. The good news is I don't plan to touch my sky right now. In fact, I'm not planning to touch it at all again in this painting. And so simplifying the sky is going to strengthen that impact of the foreground uh, because I won't be distracted by the crisp lines in the background. Now as I move towards painting some smaller details, and this painting is about 8 by 10 so it's not an enormous painting to begin with, but I might consider using a smaller brush. Um, the truth is, a nice fine pointed round brush will cover, uh, fill small areas too. So I could choose to use this brush uh, for the bulk of my painting. I'm going to try to mix up a color I like for the, those background hills. I want a blue. Um, I'm mixing some cobalt here with this burgundy that was already in my palette and I think that's going to give me the warm blue I'm kind of looking for and we're going to give it a try with this soft brush. Again simplifying to keep my painting interesting and starting with my lightest values. I want my hills, the lightest part of my hills to stay that lighter value that I see in the reference photo and I'll layer over top with some darker values in a moment. Just drawing the brush along the edge of the meadow there. Once that foundational shape is placed, then I can start to get uh, a little bit more interesting. I'm going to start to add some different colors. I'm going to add a green, and this is kind of a bluish green. This is Cascade Green from Daniel Smith and overlaid on my violet that I've placed. It should give a nice kind of shadowy tone. Cascade green. And then over on this side again, I want to soften that edge so I can put my foliage over top here. So that gives me a distant hill with a bit, with a hint of green, and a hint of violet, a hint of blue. 
Uh, the blue comes as the cascade green starts to dry, it separates and has some beautiful blue undertones. And I'm using a little straight cascade green to give me that dark edge along the meadow that I can see in my reference photo. I don't want it to be too dark and we have a tendency to go near near black as soon as we see a darkest dark. That's not my approach here. And then again I'm going to soften coming down towards my foliage on this side as well. Okay, let's start to play with some foliage and have a little bit of fun with some marker making. I'm going to choose a smaller brush we're going to start with the one I'm most curious to use, which is I think my smallest triangular brush here. This is a number eight triangular. It's a, it's a synthetic and natural blend. Okay, so now we've got that interestingly angled point that we can use to create our foliage. And I'm going straight to the smallest triangular brush, which might not be a great idea. If it makes too small of shapes, then we'll go in and choose the larger version. Uh, right here, uh, you can see where I pull up some foliage on this edge, trying out on an edge first just to minimize my risk, really. Uh, you can see it's bleeding into the hill in this back part, and I think that's okay because, again, I'm just getting started we can build up a lot of layers here now I'm actually really liking with the triangular brush the fact that I can lay down I'm going to see if I can demonstrate it here lay down a brush stroke with the side of the brush like so and then from there you can pull out some shapes but I think actually the strength of this triangular brush is not in the point of the brush but in this, using it uh, as a sideways brush. And I vary the way I use my brushes. I don't just draw with the point of the brush. I love dragging with the edge of the brush and creating interesting marks from the side that way. And you can see how the Cascade Green creates really some beautiful gradations of color just using that one color alone. So we get some big marks with the uh, triangular brush let's do let's change up our colors to create some more texture um, we're going to pull out the hematite burnt scarlet and get some warm kind of rusty tones going on in here and dragging with the side of the brush getting a little dry brush down below using the point here straight up and down, wiggling it back and forth. My hand stays in the middle of the handle and that gives me a lot more freedom of movement. And I think I'm going to stick with those two colors for the bulk of my foliage here. Let's try another brush shape. This is the Series 772 Dagger Brush. Let's go with a darkest dark right now. Create some back, some greens in the very back here. This is Undersea Green from Daniel Smith. We can use the point of the brush right now, or we can drag with the side of the brush. So here's the deal. I am not the world's gentlest brush handler because there's a few things I don't love. And one thing is irregular looking marks. Over here, I don't love how kind of boring to me these all these little rhythmic lines look. They kind of are all similar, the same. And so I want to create more unpredictability and I want the brush to do a lot of the work for me. So rather than creating those little dabby marks that somehow all end up looking the same, we have to try to use our brush a little more unexpectedly. And that can take time to develop that kind of organic looking brush handling style. And having a good brush uh, can really help with that. So, oh, that stroke is nice. Letting the brush do the work means, you know, putting down one stroke and letting it be. Dragging your brush, working in quick movements, and having a few interestingly shaped brushes to add an element of unpredictability in your painting. Um, really liking um, the combination of small and large lines that I can create with one brush 
rather than going back and forth between the brushes. Now trying switching over to the number six pure sable brush uh, and it's a rigger brush, a number six rigger, so that means I get a long body in this brush that give me should give me some a chance to make fine lines and that's usually what people use a rigger brush for it's called a rigger because it was originally used to paint ships rigging but again I like using the side of the brush to drag and then the point of the brush still creates those fine lines and with that added opportunity to see some unpredictability happen as we drag our brush around. So in between those three colors we've got two greens really adding to the overall feeling of the greens in the painting and then we have the brown, just that neutral tone that kind of warms everything up and sets off those greens with a little further warmth. I'm wondering if this oval mop brush has a place in my painting so we're going to give it a try. Uh, let's use the undersea green again and this is a squirrel, squirrel and synthetic blend. We're just going to see what marks we create. Again pulling with the brush And I could see this being a really good brush for create painting large leaves. In fact, I have a painting I might try that on later, but I don't love the point that I have there for creating the grassy marks. So we're going to go back to our triangular brush, really find that it was the kind of the best option for getting our, our little grassy twiggy bits in the painting. Combination of dragging with the brush and fine lines painted by hand. So the most detail in this painting is happening in the foreground. While you're painting those details, still keep in mind your values, your pattern of light and dark in the painting. So here I have a dark area, uh, lighter value, light value here where I think I want to keep pulling up maybe a bit more green and uh, fill some of those that, that kind of whitish gap in. Little tiny dabs with the brush. The goal here is to have a variation between pattern and unpredictability. Um, some of this should echo some of what's happening on this side while it should still be interesting enough to kind of stand on its own. Then as this area starts to dry I can go back with my brush and create some lines. Uh, actually I really like those little lines right there and that's going to add a, a third layer of depth in my painting. Now I'm delighted that today I get to give away a set, a travel set of brushes from Rosemary and Company. Rosemary and Company has graciously provided those brushes for, for one lucky winner and you can sign up at the link below. If, you've, if you're watching this video and the giveaway has ended, I would encourage you to subscribe to my channel because this is not the first time I've given away uh, some great watercolor goodies and it won't be the last. Let's bring our tree right up, our bush, larger shrub, tree, we're not sure what it is. We're going to bring it right up into the sky, which is basically what our reference photo is telling us. We had that underpainting of the green uh, where we kept everything nice and soft, but now we get to actually create it. And what I'm going for is less realism and more of a spiky feeling of shrubbery. Adding the darkest undersea green just to create some contrast between our values. As I use this triangular brush I'm getting to like it more and more, creating some unpredictable 
and interesting shapes. Liking the darks that are happening in here and we'll echo that on this side and our goal to create balance. Really helps to pull back and look at your painting to be able to tell if what you're doing is working if there's an overall balance between light and dark values. They, they are easier to see if you're not six inches from the painting and you can view the painting as a whole. Okay, so a couple of things before we call this finished. Uh, with it, so much detail happening in our foreground, the background does need, feel a little bit lost. Yeah, I'm going to see if this uh, oval mop will help me. I just put a little bit uh, of a glaze of darker color over top of my distant meadow. It's feeling a little bit bland. A little bit too pale in value, I think. So we're going to just um, go over it one more time in just a light brush stroke here and there. I'm going to leave a space here too to help add some texture. And then we're also going to darken up our distant hills, I think. Just referring back to my reference photo, I spend a lot of time um, looking at the reference photo, seeing if I've gotten my values correct, my pattern of light and darks. Is the hill dark enough in contrast to the foreground? Or is it too dark um, where it blends in? And uh, it's always a challenge to get that balance right. And by darkening up my hill, am I going to have to go back over my grass in front of it, my shrubs, and create further darks I might have to. We'll talk about that in a minute. But I really want to get that balance between light and dark accurate here. And adding a slight amount of texture, that third layer over top of the hill, second layer, um, gives me just a little bit more um, that pulls your eye into the painting. I'm also going to take my little triangular brush and my undersea green and do a little bit more with my darkest values in this distant part of the painting. Using the undersea green in quite a strong saturation. And remember I said I didn't want to go too dark too soon, but now I'm a little later into the painting and I can decide I can push those darks. It's not too late to go darker. If I'd gone too dark early on, then I'm stuck. It's a lot harder to adjust a too dark value than a too light one. So take, show a little restraint and then you can always come back and go over it later. I want that feeling of distant dark shrubs. Dark line created, then a damp brush to soften slightly. This is the part where I start fussing and micromanaging my painting. We all do it. Uh, it's a good thing to be aware of, that you have that tendency to second guess, overanalyze maybe, micromanage the painting, want to add, uh, want to tweak and fix too many things. And so I'm going darker in that mid-ground, and as soon as I start to go darker, I start to lose my contrast in the foreground, so I have to pull back again. Maybe take a break if you start to feel like you're losing perspective. And uh, I'm, for the purpose of this video, I'm going to wrap it up rather than taking a break and giving myself a, a week or two to think about what this painting needs or if it needs anything else. I'm just going to finish it up right now. Put a few little dark lines there. I think that'll give us um, that distance that we need. Just a little bit more contrast between foreground and middle ground. And 
and the word on the street is that my that, that my triangular brush is my new favorite brush. Uh, it's working really well for those little marks that are giving me that texture that's so beautiful in this painting. I want to share some takeaways that will enable you to be a better decision maker in your paintings when you're painting a landscape scene, thinking about color theory and value. First of all, I want you to notice the importance value plays in the role of making this painting work. My foliage would appear to be a flat mass if everything was equally equal in value. So if everything was kind of a middle value, when I talk about value, I'm thinking in terms of a scale from say let's say one is the one is pure white and 10 is black. Our values fall somewhere in that scale of 1 to 10. And so we might have our number 1, our lightest value over here. Uh, number 10, our darkest value, which actually we don't have any pure black here, so our, our darkest value might be an 8 or a 9. And we have some dark values in, in here, and we have a really dark value in here. The placement of our values determines how the eye moves through the painting, and whether or not we're able to distinguish interesting contrasts that make the painting appealing to view. So if everything in the foreground was about a number 5 on the value scale, it would all look the same. Even though we were, even if we were using different colors, so I look for ways to have, you know, a two or a three value in some areas. Here we've got some, a little bit of the almost pure white, and then we have darker values that move in a pattern in a path through the painting, and that really helps the viewer experience the painting and move through the scene. The other thing I did through this painting was I tried to be really consistent in the colors that I used. I started with my sky, which is a blue, obviously. And when we worked with that blue, I used the same blue to paint my hill, uh, just mixing it with another color to change the, val change the color up a little bit, uh, make it a little bit of a warmer tone by adding some, uh, some of that burgundy, some of that red. And then when I went to use greens, I chose two different greens, my undersea green and my cascade green for the foliage. I chose that brown, the hematite burnt scarlet, for that warmer tone in the foliage. And I worked with those three colors exclusively in the foliage. I used some of the same greens in my meadow, um, although I did give myself permission to use that green gold uh, mixed with a little bit of my palette dirt so that I had a brighter green that looked a little bit more like sunlight was falling on it, which helped the viewer to uh, understand the weather in our painting. And the colors we use and the values we use can tell a lot about time of day and weather. <laughs> Every decision we make gives the viewer information about our painting, even the decisions we make inadvertently or accidentally. That's why I really work to be intentional about value and try to keep a consistent range of colors in my painting so that I have this lovely harmony and unity in the scene. So I'm editing video today and I realized that I never really did sit down and tell you exactly what I think about Rosemary and Company brushes. So I want to do that now and just be straight, straight up with you. How do I feel about Rosemary and Company brushes? Well, first of all, I have to tell you I've changed my position on paintbrushes over the years as I've grown as an artist. Uh, early on, I really did just buy whatever was available that I could afford, and I was more comfortable with a synthetic brush. So it was really easy to pick up a brush at my local art supply store, or even craft store. Recently, I had a group of brand new painters here in my studio, and for my beginning students, I always provide them with a watercolor kit, and I gave them synthetic, uh, just a standard kind of synthetic round paintbrush. As we painted, I would demonstrate with my brush, and then they would repeat the, the technique with theirs, and the performance just was not the same. They couldn't replicate the marks that I was making, and some of that was to do with skill, but another, uh, another portion of that was just that the brush that they were holding didn't hold the same amount of paint uh, and didn't perform the same way. So a quality brush really does make a difference, and when you start to notice that in your painting practice, then it's time to take the time to invest in good brushes. So would I recommend a Rosemary & Company brush? Well, let's think about this. The brushes are handmade. Every single brush is handled by the manufacturer. They're looked over, they're inspected, and uh, made to their standards, and they've been doing this for 30 years. That means when I receive a brush from Rosemary & Company, 
it's been handled and not just rolled off some production line somewhere. That means if I do have a problem with the brush, I can go to Rosemary and Company and speak to someone personally about uh, replacing that brush. So to me, there's, there's trust there and trust is really important for me. The brushes are handmade, so that means they're going to be a little more expensive than an assembly line um, mass produced brush. However, the brushes that I use in my studio, I've had for years. And the brushes that I use every day, my standard workhorse brushes, uh, I don't think about upgrading or replacing them for, for months on end. And I paint every day. So I get hundreds and hundreds of hours of paint out, painting out of one single brush. Because I spend a lot of hours painting, I want a brush that I'm comfortable with and enjoy using, and one that's going to last and, and hold up to my, to my abuse. I love dealing with Rosemary and Company, supporting that family business, seeing the care and attention to detail in their brushes, the fact that they work with artists and are consulting artists actively to make a broad range of brushes that suits all kinds of painting styles. Those are things that matter to me and reasons that I'm proud to work with Rosemary and Company today. Visit their website and you can grab a free catalog and see if they have a brush that works for you.